through 27. Down just a hair, Brother Michael, on the reverb. Just a hair. On this, on me. Proverbs chapter 27. I, I feel a, a need tonight to start pay our hearts more for the youth rally, and that's what I'm going to preach about tonight. Uh, praying for the youth rally. Praying for the youth rally. We're uh, fasting. Our church is in the third week, beginning today, of a 40-day fast. And I don't know about you, and I don't think it's my imagination. I believe I can tell a difference in here already. You can feel it, can't you? You can feel it. the Spirit of the Lord moving and the, the evil one being pushed back. You can tell it. And on my day of fasting, I can definitely tell it. You can feel it. The Bible said, Jesus came one day, and these people were trying to cast out a devil, and they couldn't do it. And they've been doing other stuff. And the Lord said, This kind goeth not out, but prayer and fasting. Changed any modern versions of the Bible. The King James says prayer and fasting, and your modern versions leaves out the word fasting. If you got a Bible that don't have that word fasting in it, you got the wrong Bible. Because fasting is a Bible doctrine all the way through. All the way through. New Testament, Old Testament, before the law, during the law, after the law, under grace, and be right on up to the rapture. Paul said in fastings often. And there is some things that you get when you're fasting that you don't get any other way. You don't get any other way. I know in my heart, I'm no, I'm no nothing special. I know that I don't have no supernatural ability. None at all. I have nothing. There's nothing about me that make this world give me the time of day. But I do know this. I do know if God's people will pray and fast and humble ourselves, that God will hear in heaven. Last year, we had a tremendous, tremendous uh, rally services. And uh, if you were a part of it, you know what I'm talking about. It was something else. And so I want to see God do that or greater again. And uh, we'll look at Proverbs 27 and verse 18. Proverbs 27 and verse 18. Not so that we'll, we'll uh, pray or fast, but that we will pray. So tonight we're going to start pushing praying, praying. How's your prayer life tonight? Proverbs 27, verse 18. Whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. So he that waiteth on his master shall be honored. He that waiteth on his master shall be honored. Now, you've heard me read that Scripture before. It would mean one of two things. It would mean waiting on my master like, Here, sir. Here's supper. Anything I can get you, it would be that. Or it would be, he that waiteth, I'm going to sit out here and wait on my master. That's the way I'm going to use it tonight. He that waiteth on his master. I feel a tremendous, tremendous burden uh, for, uh, for our youth rally, as always. And I feel the need... Um, man, get up and shout in the choir like that and be a hypocrite. Uh, uh, I feel a, a burden to uh, have something from God. Now, I was going to tell you I, I, just just how much pressure I feel personally. I was uh, the other day uh, coming up the road and um, from Lincoln to from Gastonia, stopped in the store, halfway between Gastonia and Hickory, about uh, 50 miles, 40 miles from right here. It was late at night. I'm on my way back home from preaching down there in Bessemer City. And I stopped in the store. I walked in to pay for the gas. This lady said, Are you Danny Castle? And I, like I always do, I say, Maybe. Why you want to know? She said, <laughs> No, I said, uh, Maybe I am. Maybe I ain't. I, I said, uh, Yes, ma'am. She said, It is so good to see you. She said, my daughters and my kids said, love to come to your youth meeting. She said, I ain't seen you in years. I said, well, we're getting ready to have another one here just pretty soon. She said, where is it? I said, it'll be at the Burke County Fairground in Morgan. Boy, she lit up. She said, now I want to get, I told her when I was on the radio down there in Belmont every day at one o'clock on uh, 1270 AM. She said, I'm going to make sure that my kids get in that meeting. Well, I went, I went on, uh, uh, up the road. The other day, I was in Hickory. I went into a restaurant, get me something to eat. I sat down, 
my waitress came to the table. And she she said, uh, "What are you drinking, sir?" I said, uh, "Budweiser." She said, uh, "No, I drink." She, uh, I'm just kidding, just kidding. And she said, uh, "What are you drinking, sir?" I said, "I was drinking water that day." And uh, she said, "Are you Danny Castle?" I said, "Yes, ma'am." She said, "Oh, give me a hug." I went like this. She said, "I hadn't seen you in years." She said, it's beer. She said, I used to come in here, you preach. Somewhere way off down in Lincoln and somewhere. And she said, I, wa- I wonder where you've been. And I said, well, we have a church in Morgan and now. And we're getting, she said, I'm coming. You tell me where it's at. I said, it's just right down that road out there. Uh, 64 7, followed all the way to Morgan. It's Highway 70 right there, going up that way. And uh, she said, I told her about the youth rally. I got this letter the other day in the mail. The Shining Light Baptist Church. Uh, my dad has been in a, running a bus route, uh, musketry since September the 11th, 2002. That's a good day to get in the bus ministry, ain't it? And I listen to your program on the radio every day. Enclosed is a check for $8. I'd love to have the cassette of the message entitled, The World's First Bus Kid and Why Have Bus Ministry. I think these tapes would be a great blessing to my father. I showed your video... They sold their soul. This, this come from uh, Level Street in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I showed my video. Uh, they sold their souls to rock and roll last night to my youth group. All 19 kids, teenagers, fell on their knees getting down to business with God. Praise the Lord. And I said, Amen. He said, His whole youth group got on their knees. Somebody called me the other day. They said, Brother Danny. Said we took the Marilyn Manson video, we showed it to a bunch of college students. He said when we got through, said all of them were in the floor crying and praying and burning their rock and roll tapes. Amen. Thank God. He's still doing work. He'll still do the work through the truth. You know, that's why the devil hates my guts, and I feel the same way about him. Amen. Amen. I, I like that preacher. They said one time, this old preacher got up, and uh, boy, he'd, he'd been rough before he got saved. And boy, that old preacher got up one, su- one Sunday morning, and he got preaching. And he got to preaching about the devil. And he got to preaching about how the de- he hated the devil. He hated the devil. And he said, and buddy, he got real mad and got red in the face. And all of a sudden, he kind of just snapped. And his mind went back to... His old life, you know, and he cut loose a bunch of for about thirty seconds, cussing the devil. He sure did. He said, "I think the devil's a dirty, low down blankety blank boom what." And boy, I'm telling you, he cussed, and everybody went, "Oh, oh, good night!" And find what he had done. And he said, uh, "He said, uh, uh, he said, folks, I'm sorry." He said, I, "I'm sorry. I don't even deserve to be a preacher." He said, "I'm sorry." He closed his Bible and he said, "I resign," and walked out the door. Everybody sat there in shock, disbelief. They said they could not believe they didn't cuss like that right in the pulpit. They said they were in. One old deacon got up. He had on overalls. An old gray-haired man been there for years and years. He said, "Folks, you heard what I heard." He said, there's no justifying what we just heard. He said, I've never heard in my life such a string of cuss words in, in my life. But he said, I want to tell you something. He said, our pastor said exactly how I feel about the devil. And he said, I tell you what. He said, our pastor was a wicked man before he got saved. And he said, uh, I, he said, I, he said, anybody can make a mistake. He said, I think we ought to go out to get him and bring him back in here and restore him and give him a raise for hating the devil so bad. Amen. And I said, Amen, brother. I'm, I'm going to try that next Sunday, see if I can get me a raise. <laughs> Amen. Uh, but I'll tell you what, boy, uh, he, he said there, I got more respect, like Jack Howe said, I got more respect for a man that'll cuss the devil than I have me to pat him on the back out there on Monday morning. And so tonight, brother, we're going to have to get something from God if we're going to have a great youth meeting, if we're going to get excited about the youth rally. Are you excited about the youth rally? Buddy, I am. I'm getting there. I'm there. God's got me hemmed up this week. And I'll be in a motel all week up there and people I don't even know. And He does me that way every year. So I can get down to business and get in the floor and call on God and put my face in the carpet or in the bedspread. And I'll say, Dear God, dear God, dear God, oh God, I'm going to wait on my Master until He comes and does something from heaven. That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to do it. I'm telling you, religion's not enough. Church is not enough. Going to the church of your choice won't do it. You can't have dead religion with dead words. There's got to be power. There's got to be power when the preacher preaches, when the singer sings, in order if we're going to see lives change. 
Like that one little boy is trying to get his friend to come. He said, why don't you go to my church with me? He said, I can't. I go to another abomination. That's it is nowadays. Brother, they, they, listen, that's a truth. He had it wrong, but he had it right. Listen, we're living in terrible time. We are living in dangerous time. We are living in a Babylonian society. The emphasis is on the senses and the release of the sensual. All the old codes have been broken down. Foul has become fair. And fair has become foul. Uh, the, the, the criminal has turned out to be the good guy. And the good guy has turned out to be the crook. Everything is going backwards. As I mentioned this morning, they're trying to sue God. People are filing lawsuits against God Almighty. Now, you know, like people got fat eating Big Macs and they're suing McDonald's, you know? They're saying, well, God, uh, I got sick. It's your fault. I'm going to sue you. Who would have ever thought that we'd have lived to see that day? Brother, if we don't pray, I've never seen a time when more kids are falling into sin. I've never seen a time when it's harder to forget teenagers to live for God. And I'm talking about we got teenagers in church. You know how the average teenager lives? Brother, they live like animals nowadays. And I'm telling you tonight, if God don't move on this generation of kids, we have no hope. Them old preachers are passing off the scene. You don't hardly go to church no more where there's old-fashioned conviction and people crying and, and getting right with God. I want to see that again. I want to see another time when God does something real. I've got a hunger down in my soul for God to do something real in our heart. You say, well, Brother Danny, he'll never do it for you. That's what you think. He will if my heart's humble. And he will if my life is right. And he will honor us if we'll wait on our Master. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you tonight, brother, he sure ain't going to do it for a bunch of Pharisees that think they're better than everybody else. He'll do it for us if we'll humble ourselves and get on this altar and pray and weep. We had a prayer meeting here last night. We had a prayer meeting. We're going to have it again this Saturday night. Eight o'clock, prayer meeting. For everybody that can't, we gather around here and sang. We sang some songs. We prayed. Sang some more songs and prayed again. We prayed for Brother Brandon down there. We prayed for Brother Dusty in his new church this morning. We prayed and prayed and prayed. And listen, brother, our church can't pray too much. I'm telling you, brother, they have ice cream socials. They have benefit singings. They have everything else. And I guess that's all right. But whatever happened to prayer meeting? Prayer meeting. I'm going to tell you, prayer is work. It's hard work to pray. It's hard work to get down on your knees and pray and pray and struggle through those hindrances that would prevent you from praying. It's hard. I read about people in days gone by. I'll never forget reading the story of Dave Brainerd. And David Brainerd, one of the greatest, greatest figures in church history. Every person in here needs to read the diary of David Brainerd. Can't hardly find it no more. Most bookstores don't even carry stuff like that. But David Brainerd was a missionary to northern England. Not, not England, the country. New England. Here in America. Up north, uh, in North America. And David Brainerd uh, fell in love with a beautiful young lady. That girl was Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher, daughter. And, and uh, David Brainerd and her fell in love and wanted to get married. But they knew he couldn't take her up there in the, in the, in the wild woods of, uh, of Pennsylvania and, and up in Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Maine and all them places because the Indians would kill her. So he said, Honey, I'm going to go do my mission work that God's called me to do. And when I come back, I'll marry you. And he went up there and he never did make it back. He literally lived on his knees. And that old boy prayed and prayed and prayed. And the world tonight is scattered with missionaries all over this world tonight. In the job for God that was inspired by David Brainerd. And David Brainerd used to stop and pray. He couldn't even speak the Indian's language. He depended entirely on the Holy Spirit of God. And they said that old boy, he'd gather them Indians around that and he'd preach to them and he'd just show them that he had a broken heart and tears. They ain't nothing. Listen, they don't care. Them people out there, they don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Did you hear me? They don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. Do you care about them? Do I care about them? Do we care? about them. And boy, that old David Brainerd cared. And he'd stand there and cry. And the first thing you know, he'd see a tear in one of those Indians' eyes. And he'd say, there seemed to be a spirit of earnestness among the Indian tribes. And he got sick. And he'd ride a horse out in the snow. And he'd ride that horse through a snow 
of a foot deep. And he'd get down and pray in the, in the, in the, in the snow. And he had a disease where he'd coughed and cut up blood. And he'd pray and cough up blood and he'd spray that snow. And it looked like little rose petals on that snow. And that was bits of his lungs where he'd spit them up. And he stayed out there because he loved those Indians and wanted to see them get laid. Now brother, when we get that kind of desire for our bus kids to get saved, when we get that kind of desire, when we say, God, if I have to sacrifice, if I have to do without a little bit, if I have to miss an hour's sleep, if I have to give up some meals, I'll do whatever to wait on my Master to see God do something. That's when God will come and do something in our church. Let me tell you something, people. Churches are a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. There's probably 300, 400 in this county. And brother, there's very few where it's be doing anything for God. And God don't want love one no more than He does other. He's just looking for somebody that'll get honest. And somebody that'll get humble. And somebody that'll pray. And somebody... You say, well, brother Danny, I've done all that stuff before. But I just got my feelings hurt in church. And I just... Well, joke crowd, buddy. Who ain't? I've been had my feelings hurt. And you have too. We've all been hurt. We've all done stupid stuff. I'm not going to sit around and cry about it all my life. I'm going to say, dear God, whatever bit of time i got left, I want to do something for you. I want to run the race. I want to see you do something. And I want to see God do something in this church and in this town. David Brainerd died at the old age of 29. And 29 years old. Some people think, well, you're just getting started when you're 29. He's done finished. Went on home to be of the Lord. He prayed. And he prayed, and he prayed until God done a work in the, in the England, in the New England, uh, Indians. I'm telling you what, brother, he waited and waited and waited on Master. Newt Gingrich, the former used to speaker of the house, said this. He said, it is impossible to maintain civilization with 12 year olds having babies, 15 year olds killing each other, 17 year olds dying of AIDS, 18 year olds getting diplomas that they can't even read and not even know the morals on which our country was founded. You cannot have society like that. Society's crumbling. Our society's crumbling. Did you hear the other day? They told me, I think, they told me at bus meeting, and then somebody else told me today, I hadn't been. I've had my TV off because of the youth rally. And Lord willing, it's going to stay off until after the youth rally. And that's just my personal thing. If you want to go on a TV fast, you might need to do that. Uh, we're, we're going to be doing that church here about the last week to have a TV fast. Do without it. I know some of you will have to go into DTs and they'll probably have to give you medication and, uh, and you will, you will go to work and ask all your friends what happened on as the stomach turns and, and, uh, you'll have to, you won't be able to keep up with, but if do you good, leave that idiot box off for a week or two. Be surprised how smart you might get. Well, anyway, they are telling me about what happened this week. Did y'all hear about it? They said it was on the news. She told me that out, was it in California? There was a car wreck. And this car run off the interstate. And this woman saw the car go off the interstate. And the woman was going down the road. She thought, well, I can't do nothing. So she called 911. And she thought, well, they'll go and rescue uh, the people. Somehow or another, something went wrong. They didn't go or didn't get it or neglected or something. They didn't go to respond to the wreck. And seven days later, is that right? Ten days later... Ten days later, somebody discovered the car. The car had gone over the cliff. There was a five-year-old little girl in that car. Mother and daddy were dead. The little girl had some broken bones and had been in that car trapped for ten days. She had not eaten a bite. She was, had broken bones and in that car with her dead mother and daddy. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? That little girl, it never eat a bite. Somebody said, well, I just can't fast. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. You say, I can't, preacher. Yeah, you can. You just don't want to inconvenience your flesh one little bit. If it meant keeping somebody out of hell, you still wouldn't want to inconvenience your flesh. You say, well, I get dizzy. I, you ain't, I didn't say you weren't dizzy. I said you won't die. 
Dizzy ain't going to kill you, Miss Lizzie. <laughs> Amen. I mean, it ain't going to hurt you to get dizzy. I mean, you might jump up in the world to get back and start spinning around. That ain't going to kill you. You're not going to die. Listen, that little girl didn't eat nothing them days. They bought her out. Uh, Mom and Daddy was dead. What a picture. What a picture of a bus kid. If that's not a picture of a bus kid, I've never seen one. You think about that. You think about all the little kids out here tonight. Their mommies and daddies are dead in trespasses and sin. They're no spiritual life. There's no hope for that little child. They have nothing to eat spiritually. Nobody tells them Jesus loves them. Nobody puts their arms around them and says, Honey, I love you. Thank God for some bus workers that'll get out there and knock on that door and say, Hey, little Sally. Hey, little Johnny. I love you. Will you go to church with me? Let me tell you, we can make a difference in somebody's life. Listen, you might go to one house and they'll slam the door in your face and say, I'll never hear Danny Castle preach. But you go right on to the next house and there'll be three or four little youth in there that don't care who I am. That'll come and get something from God and get something from the Lord. I'm telling you tonight, brother, we make a difference in somebody's life. Amen? Amen. Now I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to push you and I'm going to pressure you. It's my job to push you and pressure you to do something for God. If we'll wait on our Master, you watch God do something in our life. Can't you tell it? We're starting in our third week of this fast. You can tell the difference in here already. I can. I can tell the difference in here tonight than it was two weeks ago. And cleaner. We're getting closer to God. You say, Lord, you are close to God. Well, you ought to have seen us a month ago. <laughs> We're pretty good at what we was. Amen. We're getting closer to God, church. I didn't say how close. We still a long way to go. You seen that this morning when I asked for the knife. And I asked for the, did you see how quick I got like a, We're still pretty much a rough rednecks. But you know what? God loves rednecks. And God can use rednecks. God loves rejects. And God can bless jacks. And God will. You read that Bible, it's full of them. Full of people with imperfections, and God used them and blessed them. Amen. You know what Joseph Stalin said when he founded communism? He said, if we can effectively kill the national pride and patriotism of just one generation, we'll win that nation for God. Boy, we need to practice what we preach. Amen. We're like my mom, my mom telling Corey to eat raisins. She was trying to get Corey to eat. And when Corey was little, my mom babysitted for me. And when they, when they, they she babysit during the day, and I'd go do all my work, come back, she'd, she'd fix them something to eat. And mom would set Corey in front of the TV and put her little kid video in, and she'd say, here honey, you want this? Uh, she'd say, here honey, you want this? Corey would go, uh, I mean, you know, you don't ask a kid. And she'd say, here baby, eat some, here baby. And she'd give her ice cream. And say, well, if she just gets some ice cream, she'll be getting some nourishment. And of course, you know, if you're going to offer a kid. And finally, she said, Corey, eat raisins. Corey, eat these raisins. Corey said, shoo. She, Granny said, Mom said, she said, Corey, you eat raisins, they'll make you pretty. And Corey said, well, why don't you eat them then? <laughs> I don't know where she got a smart aleck attitude like that. Uh, but listen, brother, that's, 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 that's right. We're, we're out there. We're telling the world, we're telling the world that we've got a God that can do anything and our God is all powerful. They say, so why ain't He doing nothing for you then? Brother, we need to practice what we preach and, and help people. We believe in prayer. They must practice it. We believe in prayer. Let's practice it. Amen? What if your TV tore up? I heard a lady praying one time, God, God, help her husband quit TV and lighten and struck. Listen, brother, they, I've been to people's houses where the porch has fallen in. Literally, you have to be careful stepping on the porch or you'll go down through it. I went to one house on the bus route. We went there several Saturdays in a row and there's a dead cat laying on, on, the, on the porch, still laying there next Saturday and the next. I'm telling you, that's sorry. That's about as lazy as you can get. Man can't throw a dead cat out down in the woods. But I'll guarantee you one thing, brother. There's a big t color TV in there. They, I've seen I've seen satellite dishes out there. And Ruth, the the the, 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 the was rotten. 
on top and couldn't even couldn't even uh, 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 have nowhere to nail that thing, brother. They'll they'll guarantee you they'll have a TV and they'll they might be starving to death, but they'll have videos and they'll have a DVD player. We don't realize how hooked we are on the carnal things and how how sorry we are on the spiritual things. And we shouldn't preach to them, brother, if we're not doing it ourselves. Amen. I, I was um I was um. Uh, down in Hickory the other day, and I come out of that store down there, that little dollar place down there where TJ Maxx is. I come out of one of them stores there. I go down there and get a lot of stuff every once in a while. And uh, uh, we need some glasses. And the girl, we busted all our glasses. You know, you bust one every now and then. And they sell them real cheap down there. So every time I go, I'd buy three or four glasses. And I'd, I'd come out with some one day. And this woman was in front of me, and she fell. She just went, boom, just fell. And busted her head on the pavement. It was weird, just like she just... Over like that, and I looked down and I said, "Oh my goodness!" I put my stuff down, and her mama—I guess it was her mama. She's about twenty-something years old. She ran around, and I seen blood coming out of her her uh, head. And I thought, oh, "Ma'am, are you all right?" And I grabbed her underneath her her shoulders like this, and I drug her up like her mama, and we put her in the car. And I said, if you'll wait just a minute, I'll get something to help you. So I run in the store over here, and I asked this fellow, I said, you got any paper towels? And he gave me some, and I run out there, and Mom, she started wiping the blood off. I don't know, she had a seizure or just passed out or what happened to her. And I offered to, you know, to call, uh, you know, ambulance or whatever, and she said she'd be all right. And I got to thinking about that. I think, you know, we see something like that happen once in a while, we're willing to help out. But those people, listen, those people fail. You know what we do when somebody falls? Spiritually? kick them. Amen. Ain't that right? Why'd you fall, you stupid thing? You know, listen, brother. Help them out. Get them better. Then fuss at them a little bit. Amen. But I'll tell you what, brother. We need to pray. We need to pray. We need to pray. And we'll not be what we're supposed to be until we do. I know I'm scared tonight. I ain't even got to my sermon tonight. And I may not. I'll just give you a few thoughts here and we'll, and we'll pray. But I'm going to tell you something, brother. We need to pray. We need to pray a certain way. There's a way to pray and there's a way not to pray. There's a way to pray and there's a good way to pray. There's a bad way. You've heard me tell this over and over and over. I will never, ever forget. I was 19. And tomorrow's my spiritual birthday, so I'm going to be rejoicing all day. One of our bus kids, a girl that rides uh, Brother Junior's bus, she's about 14 or 15, wrote me a letter this morning. And she handed it to me, and she went out the door, and she said, Now, don't you forget this is from me. And I said, I won't. And I opened it up and read it. I don't, I don't think I brought it tonight. It said, Dear Brother Danny, happy spiritual birthday tomorrow. Hope you have a good one. And uh, love uh, whoever it was. And uh, she put the date on it. And I got to thinking, boy, isn't that a blessing? Those bus kids know what a spiritual birthday is. Know what a, you know, most adults don't know what a spiritual birthday is. And I was 19 years old. I just started preaching. And Bill Long, some of y'all know Bill Long, one of the best friends I ever had in this world, best friends in the ministry. One of the finest men I ever met anywhere. His brother Bill Long. He's pastor of Eastside Baptist Church in Nebo. Great man. Just a great man. And... Uh, Bill, Bill called me. He said, Danny, I want you to come and preach. He said, I'm going to let you boys preach one one night, one the other night, and one the other night. Well, I got to preach one night, and I, it was, I mean, I just started preaching. I started 11 months after I saved. I saved when I was 18, started preaching 11 months later. In March, after I'd been saved about 11 months. And I, I remember I got real aggravated. I got frustrated. And I, I got down to preach, and I would preach, but it was real frustrating. And when I get through, I think, God, I ain't supposed to be like that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. There's something missing. Well, that day he called me to preach, uh, to get up there and to come preach at his church, I made up my mind that day I was going to get somewhere. And I'll never forget that Saturday, it was Saturday morning. I had to preach at 7 o'clock at night. I went up in the woods above where my mom lives now. It's right almost where my house is right now. And there wasn't no house there then. And I found me a little place and took my Bible and I got down and I prayed. And I remember getting down on my knees like this. You know, that's the way they got down in the Bible. They got down on their knees and the palms of their hands. And I got down and I prayed and I said, Dear God, if you've really called me to preach, then I want, it to, I want to know. 
I want to know it's going. And I want to know that it has an effect on people. And I want to know. I'd heard Ed McAbee and all them preachers. God went down to a Nebo camp meeting. And boy, I'm telling you, when Brother Ed get up there, he'd preach, he'd do his finger like that. It looked like his finger was that long. It looked like every... It felt, you ever heard a preacher? And it felt like every word he was saying. Just I said, that's what I want. If I'm going to do this, that's the way I want it to be. And I remember getting out in the woods that day and I prayed. And I prayed. And I prayed. Ten o'clock. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. I'd read my Bible. I'd pray. 1 o'clock. I'd read my Bible. I'd pray. 2 o'clock. I heard somebody way down there where my sister Debbie lives. She said, Debbie, come down here. We're going to go get some, they was going to get some Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they said, come on down. We're going to eat chicken. Oh, I was 19 years old. Just called to preach. I mean, my soul. I mean... You know, when a preacher turns down chicken, he's getting sincere with God. That's how Billy Kelly said he even knowed he's called to preach. So he woke up one morning, did go to work. And when you get like that, when you get, let's search, here's the secret. When we get to where we'd rather have God, than what our flesh wants, that's when you get somewhere. Absolutely. And I remember I said, I ain't going to eat. I ain't going to eat. And my flesh said, you'll die. Because I've never fasted before in my life. He said, you'll, you'll die. It's not right. You're harming your body. Yeah. Well, we're torturing this thing, ain't we? Some of you are in no danger of harming your body. And the flesh said, I've got to have something to eat. I can't stand it. I've got to have something. I said, shut up. And the, and the devil said, if you're going to preach, you've got to have energy. And if you're going to have energy, you've got to eat. And I said, I'd rather have the Lord than I have no energy. Evening, it was like the sky opened up. And it was like something went and started typing in my head. I'm not saying God spoke to me in an audible voice. I, I, I didn't hear angels' wings, or I didn't hear no audible, but I'm telling you what, stuff started popping in my head so fast, I didn't even have to write it down, it just burnt in my brain. Illustration after illustration, thought after thought, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. If you've ever, if God's ever called you to preach, and put it, you know what I'm talking about. It burned in my heart. And that night when I got up to preach, I read the Scripture. And when I started preaching, it felt like big old bombs were going... I was bombing Baghdad, man. That's the way it felt. Just, and the altar filled up, and God did it. And from that night to this, there's never been a day yet in my life when I didn't know where the secret comes from from preaching. It's the Lord. There's preachers that think, boy, we can get a good song going, and we can get this going. And that's all right. I'm all for it. I think good music is absolutely essential in a good church service. But it takes more than that. It takes that extra little something that God gives. His Spirit gets in. People, it takes more. It takes more than just good. I can get up here and tell you some good story and illustrations on prayer and all. It takes more than that. It takes God's Spirit doing the work in our heart. He that waiteth on His Master shall be honored. Most of y'all know. I get in a bad mood when I think about it, but my bulldog Cinnabon, who's now living with some huzzy. Amen. I hope she hears this on the radio. Anybody that would steal a dog, a thousand dollar dog, knowing good and well its rightful owner is going into into what you call it? Deep contrition. Um uh, Cinnabon have said, I miss her so much because she'd sit right at them glass doors in my kitchen, just like this. And she always slobber. English bulldog slobber. And she put her lips up against that window. The other dogs would be out there just laying in the yard. And if we was fixing a sandwich, old Cinnabon would be right there at that window. She looked like, well, I'm not, I'm going to be nice. I did. She didn't have glasses. Uh, but, but, but I'm just. She looked. I didn't say you give it away. I didn't say nothing. 
Um, she looked like she had a face that nobody could resist. <laughs> and brother, she'd sit there and look in that window like, I'm not kidding. She'd look in that window and, and you'd start say, no, Cinnabon, you're not getting this. This is steak. It's cost a lot of money. This is hamburger. This is our supper. And she'd go, <laughs> I catch, you know. Man, it wouldn't be long I started feeling sorry. And I thought, any dog that's that dedicated, if they want it that bad, every time I'd look out, there she'd be. That big face stuck right there in that window. The other dog playing out there in the yard. You know what they got? Nothing. I'd have done for her or something. She waited on her master. You know what? Wouldn't it be something if every time the Lord looked down here, He'd see us doing like you? <laughs> Hey, God. <laughs> Will you give us a good youth rally? Well, I tell you what, it make a difference. I'm not trying to be ir- ir- irreverent, brother. Listen, when God looks down, every time He looks down, here's somebody from Little Flashlight. Little Flashlight Baptist. That's what they make people that make fun of us call us. God looks down. And He said, well, there He is looking at me again. Gabriel, somebody, get him. Get him. Go, just go get him something and throw it to him. And the Lord dropped a big stake on me and on this church. He that, that's what it means. He that waiteth on his master shall be honored. I, I'll, never, I'll never preach in the big, big camp meetings. Y'all know that. Ain't going to happen. They won't. And that's okay. I'll never be travel around the world and, where there's a bunch of preachers get together. A preacher the other day was scheduled... Being a scene where I was supposed to preach. And he called me and said, If Danny Castle's going to be there, I'm not coming. I mean, that happens all the time. And he told the pastor, He said, Well, brother, what's your problem? He said, Well, I believe, uh, I believe, now God's blessing him and he's winning souls and all of that stuff, but I just can't be around him. Think about that now. God can be around him, but I can't. Ah. Uh. If I felt like that, I'd say God ain't around him. Because if I say God's around him, but I can't be around him, i put you up there pretty high, don't it? And uh, so, that hurts my feelings. But every time they do something like that to me, the Lord just dumps more blessings. And, and I'm, I'm ready for them. And so, as far as being like that, you know, that's not going to happen. But i tell you what I can do. We sent out the buses this morning, got 180 kids. And brought them here, and they'll be in, and one of them will hear the gospel, and one of them will get saved, and they'll get saved at that youth rally, and they wouldn't have got saved if I was out preaching a big youth meeting for all the Christian people. So just use your head. Just use your head. Reach who you can reach. Reach who you can reach. And wait on our Master. I'd like to give you a challenge tonight. And they're, com- they're coming. I'd like to give you a challenge tonight. And I'd like to challenge everybody in here to increase at least double our prayer life. If you want to see an embarrassed bunch of people here tonight, I'd let everybody in here stand up one at a time and tell me how long you prayed this week. And I'm me, all of us. You know it as well as I know it. The average person in here probably hasn't prayed ten minutes a day this week. And we got a good church. <laughs>